Hello, I'm Holly Lynn Lee, and I'm here with our experts, Marianne, Chris, and Roger. And we're going to focus um, right now on this idea about reasoning between samples and um, populations, um, a real critical kind of piece in thinking about inferential reasoning. Um, and so a question that I have for you all is what key things do you hope students um, would be able to think about concerning the relationship between a sample and a population? And why is that important? Maybe I'd like to get started with that? I think the big thing that I try to focus with uh, uh, on in this area is how you collect the data is important. Okay. And it's, it's one of the big things to think about if you're going to make inference from a sample to a population, you've got to have an idea as to how that data was collected mm -hmm. so that you know is it really going to be representative. So that's one of the things that I, I spend a lot of time in the university classroom on and is to really think about, okay, is it appropriate to make inference using this? Yeah. And if not, what kind of inferences can you make? Right. You right. Know? So what's the nature of your sample? Right, yeah. exactly. You know, is it is it something that's a random sample? If it's a convenient sample, what kind of biases might have come in because right. it's and, that and, and acknowledging sample. those. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I try to emphasize up front is this idea of sample to population is to clearly define what your intended population is mm -hmm. versus what was the actual population that was used. And I think this is really critical when you're trying to help your students initially be critical, uh, sort of those health, healthy skeptics of news media reports that they right. see mm -hmm. and, and things that are reported in those articles where they're making inferences to certain populations, mm -hmm. but do then connect, well, is that where they actually obtain their data? Right, right, right. And I guess the next thing would be, as Rod following up on what Roger said, how they collect the data. Uh, I find that with students, like the first day of class, they think that the role of sample size is the larger the sample, the more representative the sample. Right. And so I think it's important very early on to help them understand what the role of randomization is, which is to minimize bias, versus the role of sample size, mm -hmm. which is to hopefully decrease your variability with the sampling distribution and, and give you more precision with that inference once you get to the point of making, using right. that inferential reasoning. Right, right. Sample size matters. Sample size but matters, but not to give you a representative sample. Right. right, right. I think another key thing to consider is um, how many outcomes you have. So uh, a lot of times there are a lot of activities, maybe even rolling dice, for mm -hmm. example, uh -huh. or a die, just a six-sided die. How many times would you have to roll it to determine if it was fair or not, or mm -hmm. balanced? A balanced die. Um, a lot of people think sample size 30 and so I would just roll it 30 times right. but there are six outcomes and so you're gonna need a whole lot more than that. Um, so we need to be careful too that with whatever kind of data we're collecting our sample size is appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I often get a lot of questions about that from teachers. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. good, that's good. So so then think, think about some of your favorite tasks where students are asked to make a claim about a population um, through a sample or a sampling process. Um, can you tell me a bit about this task and the ways that students might reason with it? Can I start with you? Uh, so I guess the thing that's coming to my mind uh, in terms of this, uh, one of the things that we've actually been spending a lot of time on recently in my courses is to actually uh, ask students to evaluate claims that people have made mm -hmm. based on sample values to, and they're trying to generalize to a population okay and and talk about whether or not those claims really make sense uh, based on how the person took the sample how they uh, actually you know collected the data and this is something where it's not so much the students taking the collecting the data but because we're in that you know more uh, critical thinking kind of phase take something that someone else has done and say, is that really the right way to get at it? Uh -huh. So we've been spending a lot of time doing that kind of thing. Yeah, so really critiquing the exactly. work of others right. and, and teasing out right. kind of what was appropriate or what was not appropriate. And along with that, we've also done a lot of comparison of methods, you know, having two different competing methods, both of which might not really be the perfect way to do mm -hmm. it. Right. And that they all have flaws in trying to figure out, okay, which one is more flawed, which one is more... Uh, is going to give us a better representation of the population uh -huh. uh, and, and 
that's something that really forces the students to go beyond just saying, oh, it's a random sample, that's the best one. Right. You know, when is, you know, this one going to be a better one because of the way they're doing their randomization? When is this one going to be a better one because of the way they're asking their questions, things like that? Yeah. And to really look deeper at the methods that people are using to collect data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chris, what about you? Well, I do a lot of what Roger is describing right there. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the task goes, I mean, this is this is one that is one of my favorites, which is the Gettysburg Address. Okay. And the reason I like that, and it's not like students, I'm giving them a population to work with, but it's a task that I think helps them understand some of these key ideas that we just discussed earlier about why do we take random samples versus using our own judgment to take samples. Uh, and then that they can also then start to see that this issue of random samples hopefully will give you, will minimize the bias mm -hmm. with the estimates that you're coming up with versus using your own judgment. But also it's very easy to help illustrate the role that sample size plays. So in the Gettysburg Address problem, the, Getty, the entire text of the Gettysburg Address is their population. Is their population. And they do different sampling of... Yes. Basically, the motivation for looking at the Gettysburg Address, you, you may ask the question, why would we want to look at the Gettysburg Address? Uh -huh. Well, my motivation for using it is our, our question is going to be, what is, what is a typical word length that's used mm. in the Gettysburg Address? Uh -huh. That's my question of interest. And the student says, well, why don't we just sit here and count up all the words? And I said, well, we could do that. We're in a statistics class, so we're, we're going to take samples. But the motivation for why would we even want to know that? And, and I try to explain to them, well, oftentimes statisticians are called upon, let's say a new manuscript has been mm -hmm. found, and they don't quite know who the author is, but uh -huh. they suspect that it may be this famous author right. who's passed away. So they're going to look at work that they know belongs to that author and try to get some information to right. where can they match up the writing styles. Well, let's say we found a manuscript that we think maybe Abraham Lincoln actually wrote, but we're not sure. So we're going to take something that we know he did write yeah. and we're going to analyze that. And so that's the motivation for doing the problem. It's really more conceptual. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to look at those big ideas of sampling, but students then start to say, yeah, we didn't realize this was actually done. You right. Know, statisticians yeah. work on these types of problems. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's one of those activities where when you look at the learning outcomes that come from that task, uh -huh. it's amazing. You're like, wow, I've covered so many different learning outcomes in one task. In one task. <laughs> and so when you're thinking about how can I efficiently teach in the classroom mm -hmm. with investigative learning because I only have a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. it's one of those tasks where I can cover so much with one task. Right, right. And in the high school, this would connect, I mean, a task like that would connect very nicely to their literature courses exactly. as well as their social so studies courses. Connected courses. to yeah. the social studies aspect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's just one reason it's a favorite task. Right. And that's one that uh, I, I know several colleagues that start their course with that mm -hmm. because yeah. it's something that you, you can actually just it's do accessible. on day one. You and sit down and say, let's yeah. let, you know mm -hmm. estimate the word length in this. That's uh -huh. right. And you can talk about all the biases that go into how you're selecting your sample and all the things that are going to be important in the course right, right there at that one time. Nice. Well, and adding one more piece back to the comparing groups yeah. that we discussed earlier. You know, I've been doing this for many, many semesters, and I always keep all of my class results stored away in a database. And what students find so fascinating is that the sampling distributions that we end up creating, both using their eyes versus random sampling, while they're very similar from one semester to the next, and so this is a great way to show the reliability of the mm -hmm. task. You know, right, this is right. the, this is the notion that we're getting consistent results right, right. from the simulations that we're actually performing. Yeah, and so it's really very powerful. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Do you have fun, Marianne? I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think people have heard of it. It's the capture recapture uh -huh. um, task, right? So mm -hmm. we're with goldfish, uh, where you put goldfish in a bag, crackers. And okay. uh, <laughs> yeah. I was worried we were shake them off. Actual, actual <laughs> goldfish. Uh, might be a little concerned. Really no pretty. animal was harmed in the creation of this video. <laughs> so we're right. using goldfish. So you usually put in about 300 or 350 goldfish. So it does take some effort to count yeah. those out. And you do need to know how many goldfish you have in your bag. Uh, but then students will take out 
um, so many, I think it's 50 and they tag them. So this is a process that biologists actually do in the wild to estimate populations, right? So they'll tag 50 and um, put them back in and then draw. They tag them by putting by a different put, color. Take or... a Sharpie, black oh, Sharpie okay. marker right. and just put an X on both sides. Yeah. So if you only do one side, so when you dump them out or take your sample, you might miss a tag, uh -huh. right? So make sure you mark both sides. But um, then we draw out samples of size 10 and I think it's 30 and then size 50. And they record um, a few of these samples per group and then estimate how many they think, uh, using proportions, right? How many fish they think are in their pond or in their bag. Uh -huh. um, so, so that's the activity. I, I think what it brings out a lot of ideas, as you were mm -hmm. saying. So the, the, one of the obvious big ideas is that your larger your sample, the more accurate your result you know, your prediction's gonna be. Uh, but we aggregate data for the whole class and usually you don't make it back for everybody. So it'd be a team of two yeah. or three, mm -hmm. depending on how many students you have. Uh, but you aggregate all the data and it gets to an idea that I haven't heard, but I'm sure you guys bring out uh, is, is kind of the variation in your predictions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you have, um, say look, you're looking at all your sample size tens and you have all these different predictions mm -hmm. of the population, then you, you start to get an idea, okay, it's probably in here somewhere, there's a mm -hmm. range that's mm -hmm. reasonable, and then you look at your next sample size 30 and it's smaller, it's tighter together, um, here's the range um, of values it could be, but you're, you're always kind of getting this idea of um, uncertainty that, you know, different people got different results when they pulled out their samples. Right. And so one, th one major issue with a lot of the textbook problems that I've seen, I looked at a lot of middle school textbooks, they don't all have this issue, but most have this issue, is that um, they'll have students do sim similar things like this and average data, use proportions mm -hmm. to generate an estimate, it's one value. And so they'll say, what do you think the deer population is? And it's, it's an exact number. It's like right. 500, um, you know, and if so you they think... A five, if you give 510, then you've got the problem wrong. Wrong, wrong answer. <laughs> right. And so we know that it, 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 we know being statistics people that it right. shouldn't be just one number. Yeah. Um, but most of the problems in most of the textbooks mm -hmm. have you use proportional reasons to generate one number. And so what I like about this task is that everybody's getting different numbers. You can put them all on the board and compare mm -hmm. and kind of get a sense of a range of values, right, right for what right. the populations might be, and um, and that that gets back to the variation that oftentimes is kind of stripped away, yeah. you know, in tech, typical textbook tasks. Right. So. right. Yeah. What I really like, what I think I heard from all three of you, is this idea of whether you're estimating the size of a population or whether you're estimating something about the population, right. something that you think is true about the population, that we really want to, um, that point estimates are helpful, but that interval <laughs> reasoning and interval estimates um, are more helpful. <laughs> you got to talk about the variability of those statistics, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, good. Thank it's, you very it's much. It's really to give the students a, a sense of realizing you want to come up with plausible values yeah, when right, you create right. these distributions. Right. You know, one point I'd like to make about your activity that I think is really wonderful is especially uh, at the middle school level when students are learning proportional reasoning, mm -hmm. yeah. it's really a wonderful way to help teachers see the connection between mm -hmm. that number mathematics the topic in mathematics yes. and the and the role that data can play. Right. And because I think one of the things we really want to strive for is that they realize that statistics is not a separate topic right. to be yeah. taught. Yep. That algebra, geometry, statistics, it's really all connected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a nice activity that can connect that. Yeah. Yeah. I spend a lot of time trying to convince middle school teachers um, as well to, to think about um, what other mathematical topics, if they if they have really rich statistics mm -hmm. tasks mm -hmm. that they're also teaching, and That's this right. idea of the proportions mm -hmm. that they're teaching through this task, mm -hmm. and that you don't have to to check mark, oh, that objective I teach in this lesson, this objective I teach in right. this lesson, that there's lots of different objectives. And I think it was you saying with the Gettysburg Address yes. that yeah. how many different concepts come out yes. in right. this one right. task. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that, you, that a rich task can take you a long way. And so then you don't feel bad spending, you know, a few days a on bit, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Thank you.